this amazing event and thank you for inviting me to participate. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Gunn and I am a recruitment and outreach specialist with Purdue University. Before I get to where I am today and talk to you about youth and natural resources, I wanna take you on a journey. I grew up in Maryville, Indiana, about an hour and a half away from Elgin High School and Lake Michigan was in my backyard. Um, and that's a big part of how I got to where I am. As a kid with my family and on field trips with school, I spent a lot of time visiting Indiana Jones and exploring Lake Michigan. Um, how many of you, if you're on yet, how many of you have gone to Lake Michigan and spent time at the, at the lake? And you can go ahead and put that in the Q&A box. Sarah has, awesome. Anybody else? It's, it's, it's not far, what is that? Maybe 30 minutes? If you haven't been, I highly recommend going. It's an amazing place to explore. Um, which I spent a lot of time doing. Um, but that passion and interest for the outdoors got kind of put into the background as I joined sports and orchestra in middle and high school. And when applying to college and thinking about my future career, I decided that I wanted to go into medicine and to be a forensic pathologist, um, mainly because that is what I had seen on TV and I love CSI and crime shows and I wanted to make the world a better place by solving crimes and bringing justice to families and their loved ones. Fast forward a little bit, I graduated from Maryville High School and went to Purdue University into the biology program to study pre-med. I quickly learned that that was not the path for me. Um, and after talking to my advisor, I, one of the tools that we used to figure out what I wanted to do is something that I try to share with all the youth um, that are thinking about what to do as a career. And I call it the list. And so when you're putting together your list, you'll end up with two columns. You'll have a side of what you like to do and what you love to do and you'll have a side of what you hate to do and looking at that that side of what you love to do you can kind of figure out what jobs fall into that interest area and and look into those careers for your future and so on the top of my love to do list was nature and being outside and being in the water and on the dislike side were weird smells and hospitals and sadness and you can kind of see um how a job working in a morgue is probably not the best fit for me. Um, and so in talking to my advisor about what would fit into this love side, he was telling me about this marine biology class in a fisheries and aquatic sciences major over in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue. And so I wanted to just dip my toe in and start with the class and um, this was the professor's first time really teaching the course and he wanted to see if he could take students back to his old stomping grounds to make it a regular part of the course to get us some hands on experiences in in marine biology. And so I went on this trip and it is one of the experiences that really kind of changed my path for the for the rest of my life really. And so one of the moments that I will tell you about is one that I will never forget. Um, I was in these baby blue waders here and we were using a piece of equipment called a cast net. And with, when a cast net is used properly, it'll open up into a big circle. It has lead weights around the edge. And when you drop it down, anything that's under, under that net there will be what you catch. And so I was throwing it and trial and error and it was half mooning and just going in a big clump and just not working at all. And then I finally got it to open it up and reeled it in and got like a little squitter of crab and was like, this is what I want to do. So I got back to campus and I got involved in everything I could to get more experience, to get me a career in marine biology. That was the intent. Um, I ended up working at Indianapolis Zoo and worked with the penguins and the cow nose rays. I got my scuba certification, did a lot of scuba diving at the zoo. And then from then on, I've gone on a lot of scuba trips and I was able to work on my own research projects 
and actually present those projects at a national conference. I graduated in 2012 with a degree in ecology, evolution, and environmental biology. So I did end up staying in the biology department. Um, but after graduation, my plan was to still go into marine biology. And so I interned at a shark research facility in Florida. Um, and during that experience, I learned that marine biology may actually not be the right fit for me. I get really seasick and what I wanted to do was do open ocean work. Um, and you can't do open ocean work if you if your stomach cannot handle being on the open ocean. And so I ended up back at Purdue and I managed a research lab for the last seven years. Um, and I've been able to work on a lot of projects with a lot of students, mainly in freshwater ecosystems. And I kind of really got to do what I wanted to do initially. The only difference between salt water and, or sorry, the only difference between marine systems and freshwater is just a little bit of salt. So I was able to still use a lot of the same tools, see a lot of cool fish um, and cool invertebrates still while in this freshwater ecosystem. So as an aquatic ecologist, we get to use science and technology to determine how the biotic or the life in the water is interacting with the abiotic or those non-living factors that are around them. And how the things, or in terms, or in other words, how things in the water are impacted by the environment in which they live. And so what we were doing here is looking at how an invasive part, the an invasive fish species moves. We were looking at their movement. We were checking their movement. So Asian carp, um, as you have probably heard a lot about over in Illinois, they are very prevalent in the Illinois River. Um, they are, their presence is very important because they have the same diet as juvenile native fishes. And if they find their way into the Great Lakes, if they're able to get to the Great Lakes, they will completely decimate the native fish population because those native fish will never get to be old enough to reproduce and continue to build their populations. Um, what we were doing in the Wabash River was tracking how far and how long it took them to go through the Wabash because it's a similar system to the Illinois River. And the Illinois River is connected to the Great Lakes um, through the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. And so what we did was we implemented, or we, sorry, we implemented these fish with tags that are about this big, these radio frequency tags um, we sutured them in and we put the fish back into the water and then we tracked their movement along the Wabash. We were able to see where they were going and look at the timestamps and dates and everything by using what right here is called a static receiver. And so this is connected to a stand that we built. It is held down in the water by a concrete weight um, and we mark it using a buoy. And then what happens is when the fish passes it, it collects information about that fish. And then we go back or someone goes back like I did here later in the season to collect this, this receiver so that I can download the data from it. And so we did that for several years, um, probably about five or six years. And we were able to see how far they were moving. There was one fish that went pretty much the whole the whole track of the Wabash River, um, especially from West Lafayette here where I am at Purdue, down to close to the Ohio. Um, sometimes scuba diving isn't always needed. There are some shallower parts close to Ohio where the Wabash River starts, but when you get closer to the Ohio River, it gets pretty deep and we are able to just grab, um, grab these receivers like we need to. I also had the opportunity to work on another invasive species project um, with a graduate student whose research was in New Mexico. And so he was looking at how an invasive riparian tree species um, or a, a tree species that was on the banks of the river was interacting with an invasive fish species and if they were helping each other to survive. And so we actually spent a week rafting down the river, um, which is what we're doing here with one of our post, or which is what I'm doing here with one of our postdocs. Um, and we collected the seeds from that riparian species, 
to analyze it for nutritional value. So are these fish eating it because it's nutritional or are they just eating it because they eat everything? And one of the really cool things that we found while we were on there is this endangered fish. Um, this is a razorback sucker. And we used, we collected it using a method that I actually used focusing on my research for about the entire time that I was on the, in, the, in the research lab. And this can be done in big rivers and it can be done in smaller streams. Um, and I will take a second to ask you all, what type of method do you think we use to collect some of these bigger fish? And what kind of method do you think works in, in bigger bodies of water as well as smaller streams? A large net, we do use a large net to help collect them. Um, I'm not gonna say that answer because the person that answered actually knows what I was doing. Um, but if there are any other guesses. Someone else mentioned electrofishing. We'll give it to May. So electrofishing is actually what we use. Um, and electrofishing electro is a method where we actually put electricity into the water to collect the fish. And so we do this because it's a lot easier than using um, than using fish and line or hook and line, which is regular fishing the, that people, it's, it's the way you normally fish. Um, but when we're collecting fish for science, we want to collect everything. And if you have ever been fishing before, you know that you have to use a certain type of bait to catch a certain type of fish. And it takes a very long time. Um, when we're doing that for science, we don't have a lot of time. We usually have a lot of sites that we're looking at. And we want to get them done as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So the electricity allows us to send a large area, collect the fish, process them, and put them back in the water, and then get on to the next site. Um, my research for, for the seven years really focused on agricultural fields and looking at the practices that farmers used um, and how those practices were impacting the streams that run through them and the life that lives within them. So this is a bit of a closer look. This is an electrofishing backpack. It is run off of a motorcycle battery here. This is the unit where all the magic happens. Um, but the electrons flow through this wand here and through this tail back here that's under the water. And anything that's collected in this middle section is temporarily stunned. Um, we, we have, I have a crew with me that will catch the fish and put them in this floating live well, we call them floaty, um, so that we, they are still able to, to breathe and there's water circulating through them. Um, so by the end of the site, we can go and process them. We, I will talk about that in a second, but we process them, put them back in the water, and then we go on to the next place. And so what happens to the fish is their bodies go through this thing called electrotaxis. If they involuntarily move towards the wand and we're able to just scoop them up. It doesn't hurt them. I think it's a lot more humane than having a piece of metal stuck in your mouth and being drugged through the water. Um, but we're just able to scoop them up really quickly and it takes them just a few minutes to recover, if not way less than that. And so we are looking and collecting fish um, because they are called bioindicators or living indicators of pollution. And, and insects or macroinvertebrates are the same way. And so the presence or absence of certain species can really help us determine the health of a body of water. And so when we collect the fish, um, we measure them, we count them. Um, and this is right here, we, we sort them into buckets to make that process a little bit easier on the fish. It makes it, it, spe it speeds it up a lot. Um, and then we put them back in the water. And then with the macroinvertebrates or the aquatic insects, because they are macro, they are very small, um, we have to use a microscope to identify them. And so we take them back to the lab to process them and identify them using a big old book, as you can see right here. There are lots of macroinvertebrates. This project that I was working on was a part of a, a bigger project. It was a long-term monitoring project for four years, um, but this project had four components. So one of the components 
was looking at the actual physical properties of the water and using technology to help with that. So we use this, this meter here to look at parameters such as dissolved oxygen and pH and the conductivity. And they also measured flow and depth. And then we also took water samples to look at E. coli levels. Um, there was also a team that looked at soil. So they were collecting, um, they were collecting chunks of soil from these agricultural fields to look at the composition um, that were near our, our field sites. And then also a social sciences team that was talking to the farmers and the community members to learn more about how they were using these bodies of waters that we were, that we were researching and what kind of practices they were using on their fields, um, the farmers, so that we can either suggest a practice that would better impact the stream or tell them, yes, you're doing a great job. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, you are helping the fish survive or more fish survive. There's more diversity. Well, I have been on my adventures over the years. Um, I didn't notice a lot of people that looked like me that were doing what I was doing. And that kind of led me to my next endeavor. Um, I wanted to show you that there are people in natural resource careers that look like them. And so was Birth the Familiar Faces Project. This is a screen grab from the introduction video that you can find on YouTube. Um, just go to the Familiar Faces Project. Um, I also have a presence on Instagram and Twitter, and that's just where I can really show you a lot of different people that look like you that are in natural resources, a lot of some of the research that I've been doing over the years and highlight that and, and just connect you with some things that you didn't know were possible, the careers that you didn't know were available to you. Currently, I am a recruitment and outreach specialist at Purdue University, and I have the opportunity to engage youth that would otherwise not care or see the value in nature and the environment, but I get to do that in a fun way. Science is fun. Um, I am an undergraduate student recruiter with the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, I am an aquatic education specialist which means really that I get to use my background and expertise to expose youth to the aquatic environment and form collaborations that allow, allow youth to kind of experience these fun events. And so sometimes that looks like bringing youth to campus or so our research facilities. Sometimes it looks like an outreach event where I have kids in the water with me. Um, this is actually something that's on campus, but we, if you have a body of water near your school, I can come and show you right in your backyard what fish are living in there. But to give you some kind of hands on experiences and what that career would look like and what touching fish feels like. Um, and then challenge your knowledge and see if you can remember some of the fish that I was talking about earlier in the day. And are you able to identify that on your own? Sometimes it looks like going into the classrooms and working with students in the classrooms or taking that experience outdoors and having a field day where, where youth are able to experience a lot of different activities in, in a short time span. This is just another image of where we were on a field trip and getting ready to go into the stream. Um, but it also gives me a chance to work with other educational facilities to deliver some of these environmental lessons, which is what I was able to do um, with the Dunes Learning Center in Maryville High School. We went to we went to Lake Michigan and we had a field trip and we worked with one of the steel mills to deliver some lessons and do a tour there. And that also means collaborating, collaborating with other educators to put together lessons for teachers to use on their own time. So sometimes, especially in the COVID realm, um, you want to be able, or your teachers need to be able to plug and chug where they can, where it fits. Um, and there are lessons available, especially on the Center for Great Lakes Literacy website to connect, um, to, to connect you to the Great Lakes in, in your own time. And sometimes this role has helped me 
pivot in the COVID realm and working with teachers to adjust in this virtual world um, where I help put together um, a series of lessons where we were focusing on pollinator species and how pollinator species from the bottom impact the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and so while my love for fish in nature started early, I know that not everyone has that opportunity. So I wanna do what I can to change that. And so my advice to you um, is to make sure you're getting good grades. I do know that everybody is not interested in college. College is not for everyone, but going to a trade school or doing an apprenticeship can help develop further skills for you. But still just try to get good grades. If you're interested in college, make sure that you're taking AP classes. Universities wanna make sure that you are challenging yourself. They wanna see that you're taking those challenging classes. Um, look at job boards, try to figure out if some of those job titles are interesting to you. My, I always recommend look at 10 job titles. I um, mean, look at those duties and what you'll be required to do. If that sounds, if those things sound like something that you would want to do day to day, then look at what type of degrees they require and find a school that has that program um, and that you would also like to attend. Right now, doing career interviews is very important. Call people. People are always happy to talk about what they're doing with their job. As you've seen through the through the National Bio Teaching um, Program, people are always excited to talk about what they do for their job. You can ask them what their day to day is like and what they like and what they don't like. Um, but I think one of the most important things on here is to do some volunteering and job shadowing. So go and and job shadow a career that you're interested in and do that that hands on moment to really see is this for me. Had I been in a morgue when I was in high school, I probably wouldn't have chosen that route to, to start off with. Um, I, I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't have chosen that right, route to start off with. So just, just find those things, try them out and see if they are for you. All in all, there are lots of different careers available to you. Um, these are just a few titles in the natural resource areas, but find your passion. Make that list, write, write out what you don't like to do. And if you thought that you wanted to be a doctor or be a pediatrician and you don't like kids, maybe being a pediatrician isn't the route you want to go. Um, but really just tease out where your passion lies because when you find your passion and you can find a career that is in that same area, you'll just, you'll be able to enjoy the rest of your life. And with that, thank you for listening. I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Megan. We have quite a few questions on the YouTube channel, so I will um, read those to you. But I just want to say thank you for the presentation that you gave us. Yesterday was the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, and I enjoyed listening to pa the path that you took to get into the place that you are today. Um, and I think some of our questions may be related to that. Let's see. What advice would today's Megan give her younger self? I would say go try the things. Um, go do those job shadow, like I mentioned, do those hands-on experiences, um, but don't, don't go in a career path this is probably going to shake some feathers, ruffle some feathers. Don't go in a career path because your parents think that that's the career you need to go into. Um, don't that wasn't that wasn't my case, but don't go into don't go into your career path because your your parents think that's where you should be. Don't do something because your your friends think it's cool. So one of my best friends always says, "I never saw you doing this." Like I you go and you get dirty and you're covered in fish slime and grime and I love it. Um, but do what makes you happy. 
And that, that is that is what I would tell her. I would tell her, do what makes her happy. Thank you. How much of your time as a scientist do you actually spend in the field conducting investigations? So when I am no longer in the field anymore, um, but I, when I was in the field, it really varied. In the beginning of my time, we had a lot of graduate students in the lab and we I think my first field season, I spent eight months in the field, three months of it straight from about wow. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, um, because you just, you kind of have long days um, and you want to get everything done as you can. But then the last project that I, I was working on, we only went out twice a year. We went out in May and we went out in September. And those were three to four day trips at a time. And we, we pick those dates because you have different species, different fish species that are occupying those bodies of water at those different times. I see that you were wearing diving equipment in one of the pictures. Is that something that you had done prior to um, working in the field or is that something you learned as you were involved in your studies? So I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist and I knew that scuba diving was a big part of that or could be a big part of that. So while I was in undergrad, I took a, um, I joined the marine biology club or the, sorry, I took, I joined the scuba club and they, they got us certified there. And so I was actually certified in 2012, sorry, 2010. I was certified in 2010 and have been using it ever since. I have been mm -hmm. diving pretty much at least once a year um, with this certification. But with my job, I did it a lot going out in the Wabash River and looking for receivers. I teach a marine biology class in Florida and we go diving on that trip, not necessarily as part of the course, but one of our free days. But there was one trip where we lost some equipment and we had to go diving in the ocean to, to find it. We have some schools from Kentucky and Tennessee that lost power. So they have some questions on YouTube that I'll ask you. They lost their, I don't know. I don't know how they can get us their questions. Okay. Is electric fishing dangerous from Jessica? It can be. Um, so as you can see, and you can see it in this picture here, we are actually wearing waders. So we have a protective barrier. They're kind of like overalls. Um, that we wear to protect ourselves from getting electrocuted. The water isn't able to pass through there, and so the electrons are not able to pass through there. And we don't put our hands in the water because you will get stunned. Um, but using a backpack electric fisher is a little bit less dangerous than using a boat electric fishing unit, which is what we use in bigger bodies of water. If you fall off of a boat um, while the electricity is running, it could cause a heart attack. So it, it could be dangerous. Okay. And then I will answer a question from the Q&A. Hannah um, wants to know what my favorite freshwater and saltwater fish is. Um, I will start with freshwater. My favorite freshwater fish is actually a fish that's about this big. Nothing really too special about it. It's called a Johnny, Daughter, a Johnny Darter. They have little Ws on the side of their body. They look like they're wearing Charlie Brown sweater, um, but they're just, they're just really cute. Um, my favorite saltwater fish is called, is the mola mola, the ocean sunfish. They are these giant pancakes, really. Um, but what they do is they will float on their side and birds will come and pick the parasites off of their side of the, off the side of their body. And then when they're done, they'll float to the other side and they have these little, these little fins. They'll float to the other side and the birds will pick the, the parasites off of that side. And I just, I just think that's fantastic. Like, how do they know? They're the largest bony fish um, with these, these, little, these little fins, um, but those are my favorite. Let's see, I think there's another question in, oh, do you still like to fish from Sarah? I have never liked to fish in general. <laughs> Electric fishing has spoiled me. I like that it can be quick. I know exactly. I know that if I put this, I put this electricity in the water, it's going to give me something back. Um, 
But fishing, you could wait all day. You can know that the fish are there and never get a bite. Um, so I like that that instant gratification. Another question from the YouTube channel. Um, do you like to study cause and effect or structure and function more? I would like to study cause and effect more. Um, so looking at how, how those farmers, what they were doing and how, what effect, what, what processes they were using that were causing this effect on the fish populations. And are these fish populations, are they, are these streams, are they full of fish that are very tolerant to pollution? And if they are, why, what is making this not a good place for sensitive species to survive? Or those fish those, that need cleaner water to survive? Did you, going off of that question, did you tend to find more farmers that were using processes that were harmful to the fish? Or did you find farmers that were using those that were not harming fish? I think it's a good mix. Um, sometimes the, the best practices are expensive, um, but there are government, there's government funding to help facilitate that. But they, I mean, this is their job, right? They have to see that incentive um, for them, that financial incentive to be able to use those practices. So how, how responsive are they to your suggestions? It depends. So what we have found is that if you find that one community member, that one farmer that the rest of the farmers are, listen to, and you, you talk to them about what, that, what the processes are and what they can do to be better, they will more listen to, they're more likely to listen to that person than they are us. Okay, here's another one going back to your schooling, which you shared with us. Um, let's see, I lost it. Oh, how often do you use math in your work? This person says that they're scared of math. Don't be scared of math. Um, math is just, it's just numbers. Now we have a lot of technology. Excel is actually where we use to, to crunch all of our numbers. We input all of our data into Excel. There's some functions that you can use on there to quickly calculate um, some of the answers. There are people that are trained in statistics that can run those analyses. And so you don't have to do some of those things. You can still work in this area and not be fully into using the math, but there are some calculations that you need to, to know how to do, but they're job specific. So you can, learn the, you can learn them when you get to your job. Probably the more you use it, yeah. <laughs> the easier it becomes. Yeah. Um, here's a question from the question and answer. What do you think are some of the most important things women can do to encourage girls and other women to pursue STEM if they're interested? I would say be good role models. Show, show, show the young girls that there are people that look like them that are in these STEM fields. And social media has really been able to um, help us amplify that. And you can you can follow hashtags and see a whole wall of of women and girls that are that are in STEM in different fields of STEM, whether that be biology or technology or environmental sciences. Um, but doing that and, and encouraging them to join camps or workshops that, that are available to get them more skills. There's coding for girls and um, engineering for girls, like workshops that they can participate in to get, to get those skills. And they don't have to feel like um, they're being pressured or having to compete with boys in the classroom because traditionally boys are the ones that that are inc more encouraged to, to work on STEM, um, but just showing them maybe in this, in this smaller space that they can do it too. That's one of the reasons we're so excited to have you here today is so that you can share with the girls of the area as well as the young boys and they can see other areas of science that they have never even thought of before. Um, another question, do you find, teamwork is a big part of your day or is this field competitive? 
Teamwork is a huge part of my day. I could do, I wouldn't be able to do anything without a team. And so whether it's a crew of one person or a crew of 15, um, this is actually, there were three, there was somebody taking the picture. There were three of us on the boat this day um, when we were, we were actually looking at how high the water level was. Um, but there are, there's safety in numbers. But when I am running my crew in a, in a smaller watershed, sometimes it's, it's just two or three of us that are in the water at a time. If it's a bigger water body, maybe that's four or five of us in the, in the water at one time. The lesson plans that we just released, um, I worked with a group of about 10 educators to put together a lesson plan collect, connecting the Underground Railroad to freedom seekers. And that was a, a big effort that took about a year to put, to put together. And so sometimes it's smaller. There are times where you work, when you work alone, um, when you're identifying insects, you don't, when you, when you really know the insects that you're looking at, you don't need a lot of people working at the same time. So that's more solitary work. But a lot of the time you are really working with a lot of, a lot of people and a lot of teams. Now that you're doing more of the research and the outreach, do you find thing, there are things that you miss from when you were in the field more often? I do. I like being outside, but I love, I absolutely love showing kids something exciting that they've never seen before or showing it in an exciting way so that they get interested in it um, and kind of pursue that more. And maybe, maybe, they don't want to go into an environmental career, but now they have an appreciation for nature and they're, they're looking at the leaves that have fallen and trying to identify the leaves on trees, um, or they're looking for different plant species or different pollinators while they're out and about. They just have that, that more appreciation. Okay, let's see. Um, this one says, have you ever used fish tubs for food instead of dissection or I'm not I guess I'm a little unsure of the question so whoever asked that question if you could ask it in another way or do you understand what they're talking about Megan do you, no <laughs> um, when you were in school did you do dissections did you I did. Uh, I did do a lot of dissection and as I was looking for pictures to include I found a lot of dissection pictures but they're not necessarily appropriate pictures to present. Mm -hmm. um, but I, did, I think it's, so if you think about the morgue side and the weird smells, that bothered me in that present, or in that instance with humans, but I don't mind it necessarily when it's fish. Mm -hmm. And so I can, I can cut open a fish and, and do a dissection, or I can cut it open and implement, or, or implant, that's the word I've been looking for implant a radio telemetry tag and suture them up and put them back in the water like I that doesn't bother me at all um but there's something about human blood um and smells that just they don't sit well with my stomach let's let me check and make sure that I have all the questions from YouTube there are some really cool videos on YouTube though um that Sea Grant has produced that you can look at actual fish dissections if that's something that you're interested in. Let's see. Are the fish okay after the electric fishing? Is one yeah, of the questions. They are. The majority of the time they are. Some fish get hit a little bit harder and aren't able to recover. Um, but I would say that more than 90% of the fish recover within the first minute or so. And we're able to process them and watch them swim away. One of the questions that's come up often throughout um, these national biodiversity teaching segments is about the impact of COVID. How has it, the COVID impacted your job? In a variety of ways. So I will start with the research lab. I actually ended my time in the lab last summer, so in the middle of COVID. Um, because the project was was pretty much over. And we had one sampling event. We were gonna do our May sampling 
of the fish and the aquatic insects and look at the habitat. And we weren't able to do that because at that point in time, you couldn't be close together. Um, you couldn't, even with masks on, you were, we were highly discouraged not to be by each other. Nowadays, we could, we could go and we could do that. Um, but back then we couldn't, we couldn't go and we couldn't collect that data. So we have, we have missing data points. Um, and we actually use that, the information we have to report it to the Indiana Department of Environmental Management and they report that information to EPA. Um, so we are, we are missing a data point there. Um, but as far as the education realm is concerned, I'm not able to do in-person events anymore. A lot of them have been virtual. Um, I showed you all the, the Mondays with Megan series that I did with the teacher. She was working with her classes in May and wanted to make it more interactive for them because they weren't engaging when they were working from home. And so I came in with the fun stuff um, and was able to connect what they were learning in a quick look, in, a, in a quick way. They All of those videos have some kind of outdoor component to them. So I taught them a skill and then they were to go out and use a piece of technology. Um, sometimes it's an app, sometimes it's just their eyes and they're making observations, um, but to, to help engage them in what they were learning. So in a way it, it, it can help you even um, with more outreach, you know, the, yes. you were yes. there for her class every week, whereas to make the trip to the class would have been, well, depending on how close the school is, it could have been more difficult. Yes, exactly, so. exactly. Let me just check for any more questions. One more here. I may have missed it, but there is, is there a summer camp program you recommend for high school students interested in marine biology? I don't know any specifically for marine biology. I know that Purdue has some summer camps for high schoolers. Um, and camps throughout the year where they can get some hands-on experiences, but I'm not aware of any summer camps for, for students to learn more about marine biology. My guess is that there are some that are closer to the coast. Um, and if you are able to travel that far, go ahead and do it. That would be an awesome experience, but I'm not aware of any specifically. What is the most memorable experience in your professional career? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that's an excellent question. And I don't know if I have an answer for that. There's just so many experiences that have just kind of really excited me um, and given me more passion and more drive for what I'm doing, um, which is why I love the, the environmental education path that my, my career has taken. Um, I want to make a difference. I want to, I want to change the world by empowering younger kids to, to appreciate the environment and champion for the environment. Um, and I really get to do that now. And I can, I can see that, that light bulb go off and that, that excitement go off in their faces when something just, it just clicks. And now it's really interesting. So that, I mean, those are, all of those moments are really, really memorable. Another, how do you get the lesson that, um, how do we get that lesson? It sounds amazing. The lessons Wait. that we're talking about. Um, so how there are, you can go to, for the Mondays with Megan series, you can go to YouTube, my YouTube channel, to find that at the Familiar Faces Project. And if you are looking for the Underground Railroad and Freedom Seekers Project, if you go to cgll.org you can find those there and a and a lot of other lessons um related to that and then um illinois indiana sea grant has an education tab you can find some learning at home resources there and those those are either their their toolkits that you can use or their individual lessons that you can incorporate um, to learn more about the great lakes awesome Let's see, let me do a check for any more questions to make sure I haven't missed any. I think 
I don't think we have any more questions, but I want to thank you very much for coming today and sharing everything that you do with us and inspiring other young people to follow in your footsteps. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.